If I just said, Ruben, I want you to create something beautiful, do whatever you want. What's the first thing your brain does when I say, just do whatever you want? The, the way that we can get better at becoming a better soloist is a way that you can think about it is, how do I deepen my storytelling capacity? Invite more people in to maybe go to different places and also be more available to, if I'm going down this road, I want to go down this road instead. You know, have the ability to choose which kind of narrative.
What an intense track. That is awesome, man. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was a track called Pulsar by an artist named Chase Bird. Chase, Chase Baird, Baird yeah. I'm sorry. That's fine. He's yeah. an incredible sax player. Oh, yeah. And, um, man, before we get into this lesson, Steve Lyman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, where can people reach you if they want to check out more of your stuff? You know, my, you can find me on Instagram at Steve Lyman Drums. It looks like Steve Lee Man Drums. I hate that. But yeah, it's Steve Lyman Drums. I have a Facebook page that I check every once in a while. You can also find me at my website, stevelymandrums.com. But my Instagram is probably the quickest way to get a hold of me. Thank you so much, yeah. man. Cool. So we have a killer lesson for you guys today. This is called the Jazz Drumming Solo Formula. And uh, but before we get into that, I'd love to hear you play us a solo man and uh, just give us a little bit of taste of some soloing first, and then uh, sure. give us the formula. Okay, cool. That Thank was beautiful. You. Thank you. So, diving into the jazz drumming formula, um, how do you approach this thing? What is this formula? What do people get out of it? Like, can you use this in all different styles of music? Um, man, share your approach. You know, it's off. Thank you for, first off, it's just a huge honor to be here on Drumio. So, thanks to you, thanks to Jared, Dave, and everyone here behind the scenes. It's, it's real privilege. Um, so, I think. You know, it's really good to parse things out. If I just, if I just said, Ruben, I want you to create something beautiful. Do whatever you want. What's the first thing your brain does when I say, just do whatever you want? If I'm behind a drum kit, it could be, I don't know, it could be anything. That's true. You know, maybe I mean, I'll throw the drumsticks right at you. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, that would be fine, I guess. No, but what what it, it's really coming at the idea that limitation actually helps us expand um, compositionally and 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 as players and also as thinkers. So, the the way that we can get better at becoming a better soloist 
is a way that you can think about it is how do I deepen my storytelling capacity, right? So the more, the more tools that I have to build more meaningful story, I'm going to have a capacity to invite more people in, to maybe go to different places, and also be more available to, if I'm going down this road, I want to go down this road instead. You know, have the ability to choose which kind of narrative. So a way that I'm, that I'm trying to talk about this is, the rudiments are really great. We all need to have the skills. We need to have our hands together. We need to have um, technique. But ultimately, rudiments are just like, they're just, uh, they're tools. We need to understand maybe how do we have a deeper backdrop so that the tools that we have can create a more meaningful story. So what I have are basically four mechanisms. The first one is let's really deepen our melodic playing. So melodic, moving forward, really playing a melody. We'll go deeper into that realm. The second will be rhythmic. Okay, we're going to really only focus on building deep and meaningful rhythmic connections that challenge us and, and move us forward and hopefully draw people in. The third will be textural, so creating soundscapes that create a visualization that we're trying to go for. And then the fourth is what I call harmonic or vertical. So harmonic is, uh, you know, all the, all the previous realms are, are something like this, but the drums, we can also do this played at the same, or three notes or four notes, played at the same time vertically. And so that can be in the independence realm. Or like if I was a pianist, that would be like a, like a chord, right? So I can use that to help framework my playing as well. So I can pick one of those four topics and I can intertwine them as I want. And hopefully that's going to make me a better story tale, uh, teller. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's get started on the melody. OK, cool. So I got this concept. It's called the, the No BS Game that I got from my teacher, Ari Honig, who's really the master of, of playing melodies on the drums. So for those that don't know, that don't know Ari or this kind of way of playing, it's, you actually have a melodic instrument in front of you. And you can get really deep with that. So these are four drums, but I actually, if I want to go a step further, I actually have a whole octave, a whole piano. So right. So I can actually have really selective notes, and I can be very mindful of what notes that I want to choose to play a melody. So I'm going to play um, a blues melody, a jazz blues melody called Straight Note Chaser. And maybe before I play it, I'll sing it so you can get a, a, a sense of it. So it goes like this. A one, two, three. Three, four. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mimic that melody as best as I can. And the bass drum, too, is also part of that melodic component. And I'll keep two and four in the hi-hat. The melody that I'm playing is, I'm, I'm trying to nail that melody in terms of the pitch of, of the melody, not just the rhythms, but also the pitch of, uh, of, of the drums to match that melody. And what's tricky about that is this kind of goes counter to the way that we practice rudiments. So most of the time we practice rudiments, and it's, it, it's a good way to do it, but we practice this, you know, like root, paradiddle. You know, Swiss Army triplets. Get 
really good at playing rudiments so that when I have to play on the drums, I don't have to think about it. And if I don't know what to play, I can go. That's cool, but I'm not like, at this point, that's not like super hard for me, right? Um, and so I'm, my hands, I'm sorry, my brain is following my hands right there. But when we practice playing melodically, my hands have to follow my brain or my ears. And so what happens to play melodically, I'm going to come up with different stick patterns and orientations that I'm not, not really used to. So I have to be really on my best guard. So what then is going to happen is if I can play the melody, you should by then maybe hear the form of the song. And if you can hear the form of the song, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take a solo where I'm only going to play what my ears tell me to play. And if I do my job right, you'll hear the form even though I'm not playing the melody anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm going to play the melody um, maybe just once more, and then I'm going to play a solo for a couple of choruses, and hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Three, a one, two, three. I stopped right there, what did I do? Six stroke roll. So the idea is whenever I find myself playing a rudimental idea to not do it. So whenever I move through any of these four quadrants, so mel melodic, rhythmic, textural, or, har or harmonic, I'm going to really honor that. So I'm going to try and do that again and watch how I don't really try to navigate the rudim rudimental realm. kind of hard because you're you you're playing stuff that you're not used to but could you sort of hear the melody when I was playing that absolutely cool yeah. so this is a little bit more of like the coming from the bebop era developing jazz music so if you're gonna do this kind of concept thinking of the melodies how would you approach that in more of the modern setting like the track you played in the opening like a modern jazz setting so like melodic in the modern jazz setting um, the kind of a, the same concept basically yeah, I think so. I mean, so in the modern jazz setting, so like I'm in a band with Chase and we're playing some pretty intense uh, music sometimes. Um, what can be helpful is to, so maybe another, so we have these four categories. So maybe another sort of subcategory, we could maybe have density versus sparseness. And when I'm really sparse, I'm really meaningful. So on that one clip I was playing in like 13. And so I'm gonna be really dense. And then to get a different sense, I'm going to be really sparse and maybe in melodic means. my usual, I know two rudiments, that's one of them, no, uh, the six stroke roll. So what I was doing is I was playing maybe over a complex form, but I was really trying to be mindful of one note at a time, what am I hearing? Versus like, that's cool. But I can also use that when I don't know what else to play. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So for someone to practice this, they should check out some jazz tracks, learn the melodies. They can do that same exercise with any any melody, basically. Absolutely. Like. So a couple of masters of the melodic way of playing jazz are Frankie Dunlop of Thelonious uh, Monk. He's kind of the master of that. Um, 
Oh man, there's so there's so many modern day masters of melodic interpretation. Ari also, Matt Wilson, um, Carl Allen, the list goes on. So, um, well, it, send me a message and I'll give you all the completed list. But uh, also check out the course that we just filmed, uh, some listening recommendations as well if you have any questions. I'd love to move on to the rhythmic approach. So we just covered melodies. Yeah. And you also use rhythms as another Totally. Building block or formula piece. Yeah, and it's you know, and this is this is not something new. You know, like from classical music, you know, um, Mozart was the, the incredible melodic writer, and Beethoven was really struggling at that, and he was more of the rhythmic realm. Um, Beethoven's not really known for his melodies; but he's really known for his driving rhythms. But I mean, if you say you know, you can't really say one's better than the other; they're both incredibly meaningful. So the rhythmic realm is when I really honor one specific rhythm over a form and treat it as an idea. In the same way that I treat a, melod a, a melodic idea with focus and, and seriousness, I'm gonna treat a melody in a, in, a, in, a, in a really clear way as kind of a creative um, gesture that I really want to explore. And if I do it right, I can find new ways of interpreting it and also draw people in. So one thing that we can just do is this idea of groupings of five. So it's this sticking, it's like a paradiddle diddle, so a paradiddle diddle. But it's right, left, right, right, left. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just take that sticking through a few different subdivisions over a basic tempo and orchestrate it around the drums and see what I come up with. through different subdivisions that gives completely different uh, emotive qualities, how I, I place them in different subdivisions and how I also play them uh, and orchestrate them around the drums. How I mix, how I go from different subdivisions with that one basic idea and learn to be fluid with them is a really cool process in developing your own fluidity with those rhythms. So, like I was using fives right there. Um, so with rhythms, one of my one of my teachers in New York, a guy named Jim Black, a master uh, avant-garde jazz drummer, basically says that everything can be broken into twos and threes. So fives, I have two groupings of uh, I have two or three or three two. I have three groupings of seven. I have five groupings of nine, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So one way that you can get better at understanding fives, sevens, and nines, or with the two three concept, is so I'm going to have my hi hat and snare. Going to be two. This is going to be three. So two, three, and five. So let's say I'm in four, four. Let's say I'm in four, four, and I have I want to use groupings of five. and match fives and sevens in four. And I'm treating these as templates uh, for creative um, ideas. And I'll, maybe what I'll do to further illustrate this, I'll be in four bar phrases. So you can hear that I'm honoring four bars using these odd structures.
I'm getting from this one, it's kind of like the counter to the first exercise. The first one, you're being disciplined about keeping these melodic ideas and staying away from rudiments. But this one, you are playing patterns. And I think mm -hmm. as long as you do have the understanding of melody, then you won't sound boring when you are playing your patterns. Yeah, like, I mean, there's, no, there's nothing, of, exactly, there's nothing wrong with patterns. You could think of in the melody as like, as a, as a living, breathing thing. And then when I'm, when I'm practicing this way, I'm treating the fives and sevens in that context as living, breathing things. So I'm treating them um, not just something to play, but I'm wondering how can I, how can I see them as clearly in as many different ways as possible. Um, so you, in one way, you have to focus really uh, strictly in that if you want to go deeper. But notice I'm really focusing on that alone. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Learn your melodies. Then you can use your rudiments and, and patterns to your advantage if you're thinking musically. Yeah, and then um, as we'll, we'll talk about later, we can combine the two. And when I have melodic ideas with maybe a deeper sense of rhythm, then I can come up with some really cool, interesting territories. Cool. Let's move on to your next point on texture. So texture, yeah. So maybe um, a good example to check to is also Dave King's lesson when he was here talking about sound. But texture is the the quality of creating an atmosphere of the drum. So I have these really cool drums and I have these really cool cymbals. So I'm not, uh, uh, one of the great masters of this is, is Marcus Gilmore, one of the great jazz drummers alive right now. And he's able to create story, musical drama, to creating different musical textures. Um, my friend Gilad Hexelman, the great guitarist, I asked him, what's it like when you play with, with Marcus? And you know, as, as, as amazing as Marcus is rhythmically, what it feels like from, from Gilad's perspective is it just feels like air. It feels like this quality of being able to breathe. And so the textural realm is really important. So I'm just gonna play some time and really focus on the textural realm and hopefully I, I come across in some way. time and I'm, 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 I'm filling and I'm maybe soloing to some degree, but I'm thinking more in terms of shapes as the language of expression, but, and also the dynamic range and also the spectral range. So big open sound to really short, you know, really short staccato sounds. The difference between those two is going to give me as a player, I'm going to have more depth to my playing and I'm also going to be able to, to draw in more people. You can take what you worked on before, like a pattern or something, but it's just like changing the surface and maybe making use of staccato and long sounds will change up that idea even more. Even though it's the same sticking, it's like that's yeah. how you can broaden your solo playing even more. You know, and another way of thinking it too, that was really helpful for me. So I, I naturally am kind of an on top player and I play kind of up from up here, right? And so my sound of the kit is more from the sticks up, so like a high, from the high point of, of the drum. So air, the air of the cymbals, and you know, the, the fast moving nature of the tom. But what I'm not always good at is the low part of the drums, the frequency of the low bottom big spectrum. So one thing that's really good for me from the textural perspective is when I notice my ideas are up top are really moving quick, I can use uh, the bottom end of the spectrum as storytelling devices to, to help make my playing a little bit more fuller. So.
chops or two notes played at the same time are helping this high register texture have a little bit more depth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. So you really, like on the topic of storytelling, that's what, you know, basically what we're focusing on here. And these things kind of like allow you to, like playing really quiet or playing loud or something like, that's like different parts of your story. You want to build up the intensity and bring it down and it helps to really keep it interesting. Totally, yeah. It, it helps keep it interesting and it helps to, to ground me uh, as, a, as a player and to keep it interesting, interesting for me as well. Awesome. Yeah. Um, your last tip here on harmonic playing. So this is kind of a deep one. So harmonic, what I mean by harmonic is vertical. So, you know, the way you can think about it, a pianist has the melodic notes moving forward in time this way, but also has the ability to play chords. So a chord is two or more notes played at the same time. Well, we have that, you know, like two notes, double stop, triple stop, quadruple stop. So what we can do, like what, what would my playing... So the opposite of, of vertical would be linear. So linear is when no two notes are played at the same time. 3E and a 4E and a... Okay. That's all melodic, it's not, it's not vertical. So what would happen if my playing, I'm gonna start ideas where it's either a double stop two or more, more, more notes play at the same time, triple or quadruple, and I'm going to end a phrase with the same thing. Watch what happens to my ideas and my playing overall. Kind of like this, like it's. I don't want to be linear. Or I, don't, I don't want to be double stuff. Okay, I will. It's kind of like uh, my hands are trying to reject that. So like for instance, pulsar really helps for me to have that kind of way of playing because it grounds me and it keeps me focused on the time. So if someone was just starting out and they were just like, how can I build my solo playing? I don't know too much. Like, how could they maybe take these ideas and like condense into something simple, like a simple starting place? What would that be? The, all four of them together? Either that or uh, one of these, uh, you know, just the one we just worked on or... Yeah. Um, so melodically, be able to sing any song, like be able to sing a song. And it doesn't have to be a hard song. Like just, if you can sing any song, and then find a way to play it on the drums in time, that's half the battle right there. Because you're gonna learn language that you didn't have before. Rhythm, what I would do is I would um, find a certain pattern that challenges you. So pick one pattern, what, whatever it is. Um, and maybe find out what does that pattern look like in different subdivisions. And we can, I can talk and give a deeper example of how to get deeper into rhythm if you want in a second, but maybe this that's a little, more advanced than this. Texture, just explore concepts, ex explore polarity. So a polarity is two opposites. So what is the highest high in your drum set and what's the lowest low? So for instance, this is the, what's the highest high? It's probably this and the bass, or this and the bass drum. You know, find different frequencies that make a different quality uh, for you. And then uh, vertical structures, I'll give you something that's really simple. So like, Play, just to get a sense of it, play a paradiddle. This is kind of an easier exercise. Have your, have, so anytime you're working with an independence exercise, I kind of think of it as, an, as a science experiment. So as any science experiment happens, you have a constant and a variable. So this is gonna be my constant, my hands, and let's say my bass drum is playing quarter note. Okay, that, that'll be a constant. So what would it sound like, or I'll have this be the quarter note. What would it happen if my bass drum played all the 16th note partials? So it's vertical because my bass drum's always playing with my hands. Does that make sense? An 
idea to help you get started down that rabbit hole. So did you have any more things to elaborate on or did you want to tie all of these points? One together? thing that can really help, help you to deepen your rhythmic process is uh, to, and to really understand them over form is to sing a rhythm over that form. So the people that I, that I look up to and, and I consider having really great sense of time, they practice time away from the instrument. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sing straight note chaser and I'm going to play a few different rhythms. Um, and what you're going to notice is it's actually kind of hard. Uh, but what happens is this becomes, this is where you want your time to be. It's not the drums. It, the drums ultimately is an extension of what we are as, as, as timekeepers. So I'm going to play these rhythms of straight note chaser. Dotted quarter, half note triplet, fives and eighth notes, swung eighth notes, and then fives and eighth note triplets. Okay, here I go. One, two, and one, two, three. Ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba ba do ba da ba do ba do ba do ba 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 do ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba that works out nicely because a dotted quarter resolves at the end of that phrase. The next one, half note triplet, I have to insert the, the one triplet to the trip of two in between the melody. So this is kind of a sneaky thing. One, two, three, four. Ba do ba do ba, ba do ba do ba do ba, ba do ba do ba, ba do ba do ba, ba do ba da, ba do ba do ba do ba. Ba do ba do ba, ba do ba do ba, ba do ba do ba do ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba do ba do ba do ba. Okay, now the next one will be groupings of fives over that melody, and it's not going to resolve. But what you're going to find is you're going to be able to hold the form and the rhythm on a deeper level by singing it. One, two, three. Ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba ba do ba ba do ba do ba do ba 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 do ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba do ba do ba do ba does that make sense? Yeah. And then wor working on the half note triplet's really great because the one triplet, fives and eighth note triplets, this is the last crazy math thing I'll give you, but <laughs> it's the opposite. It's the one, the let of one triplet, two triplet, the let of three, and then the trip of four. So it goes one, let, trip, triplets and fives. Two, three, four. But Ba do ba ba do ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba ba do ba da ba do ba do ba do ba 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 do ba do ba do ba ba do ba do ba do ba do ba do ba does that make sense? That's some like brain twisting stuff, man. <laughs> it is, but you know the thing is though, that's what that's what you need because so what happens oftentimes, that's actually the most important thing. Mm. Because what happens is you develop all this language soloing. But then it's your turn to solo, and let's say you practice this fill. But then something happens stick falls off, then I don't know where I'm at. So the thing is, time, if time's here, I, don't, I can start and stop any phrase that I want whenever. Three, mm. four, uh. on phrases starting on a downbeat to keep my place. Mm. And practicing melodies that way and rhythms and melodies that way is critical. 
man, that's just so useful for like every, like it just gives you so much more headroom or headspace you want to say when you are playing. So like you said, if something, if you make a mistake or something, you know, you don't have to be thinking as hard and using like every bit of your energy to try keep like yeah. keep everything going. So and it, you also feel like you have more room to breathe to play ideas. You're not limited to these little phrases. If I have more room to breathe, I can create larger phrases and I can I can start and stop whenever I want. Awesome. So putting all of these things together now. Okay. I'll give it my best. Thank you so much for everything, man, for the soloing, everything. If you guys want to see more of Steve, make sure you visit drumio.com. If you're an Edge member, you will already get access to his stuff. We filmed some awesome courses and are going to be filming some more awesome courses on beginner jazz playing, an independence course, also a course on must-know jazz standards. That's all coming out. And uh, thanks again, man. Thank you. We'll catch you guys later. Would you like to play us out with another solo? Sure. Okay, I'm gonna leave the room first, and then I'll leave you to uh, tell us another story. Okay. <laughs>